Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Entitled parents at Chick-fil-A do not recognize the meaning of closed. After that, my entitled father wants me to give up one of my $300 bikes. And after that, he ruined my sister's only birth experience, so I made sure he'd never forget her. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen doesn't get her Chick-fil-A. Like heck I won't! So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Entitled parents at Chick-fil-A do not recognize the meaning of closed. Hey, it's me, the one Chick-fil-A guy again. Anyway, like I said, I've got a few stories to share from this whole sickness fiasco, so here's another one for y'all. Today I'm going to be telling the tale of the family who did not recognize that we are privileged to close whenever we need to. So for some background, we usually close at 10, but since everything's been going on, we've started closing at 8. Usually there are a few people each night who will pull up after we close, and they're naturally disappointed but understanding, and we try to not let them leave with a bad experience. However, once in a while, some people refuse to take no for an answer. So on this particular Saturday evening, I was working what we call the cash box. If you've never been to a Chick-fil-A, or at least one that does this, it's essentially a cash register midway through the drive through that takes payments, processes mobile orders, and resequences the order of cars in case the order is wrong. It's pretty efficient and keeps the people at the window from taking too many payments. So anyway, the time was about 7.55 and I was at the cash box sitting on a little bench and making sure the tablet was charged. There were three or four cars in the line who I had already taken the payments from and I was just chatting with one of the iPos people, the guys who come to your cars with iPads and take your order. We were just talking about the weekend and stuff while waiting for cars. One more car came through the drive through so after I took its payment, I started to pack up the cash box, which consists of a moderately heavy register and an iPad. The person I was talking to put the immortal cone in the drive through to show that we are closed for the evening. They propped open the back door and went inside while I was wrapping up wires to the receipt printer and iPad charger. As I was packing everything into the container to bring it inside, I saw a car pulling around the cone towards the window of the drive through Since I was between them and the window, I stood on the curb next to the drive through and put my hands up in the stop gesture. I checked my phone and it read 804, so we were definitely closed with only one car in line. The car was a red minivan being driven by a fairly large, stomach-wise anyway, dude with a woman in the passenger seat. I could hear at least two kids in the back seat, but it was dark and the glare from the windows kept me from looking in. The driver rolled down the window and the conversation went as follows. Me. I'm sorry sir, we're closed. We won't be able to serve you tonight. The guy in the driver's seat was very not happy. He was also not wearing a mask, which made me uncomfortable at the beginning. His words did not help the situation. Entitled Dad. P.S. I see a car at the window, and if you're helping them, you'll help us too. Me. They had their order taken 10 minutes ago, and they've been waiting very patiently, sir. It doesn't matter if you go up there. They're not going to serve you. Entitled Mom. Excuse me. My daughter wants a milkshake, and you're going to get it for her, understand? I could hear a girl screaming about her brother taking a toy or something in the back seat, and the mother turned around and very loudly whispered at them to be quiet. Now, I know that I didn't have to sit here and listen to this lady, but I also know that it wouldn't look good on my performance review if the guy they hired for being good with people basically said, No, you're going to leave so I can go home and never have to deal with you again. So my reply was, well, miss, I suggest you look somewhere else for that milkshake because we are closed. Our kitchen and shake machines are shut down and I doubt there's even food for the employees in there. So I'm sorry, but I can't help you and yelling at me will not change anything. By this time, the car in front of them had pulled forward and the guy in the driver's seat looked at me and said, I'm going to go up there and get my food and you can kiss my butt. I responded, Sir, if you go up there, you will not be served. If you refuse to leave, we will call the police and have you arrested for loitering and trespassing on private property, and then you can do whatever you want with your butt in court. 
I then turned around and went back to packing up the cash box, ignoring the sounds of raw anger and hatred coming from behind me. As the guy pulled his van up, I got on the walkie-talkie we have outside and told the people at the window there was a very angry guy and his family coming to the window. I then finished packing up the cash box, told one more car we were closed, they took it much better than the first family, and went inside. I put the cash box in the office in the back of the store and went to the front to see if the van was still there. It turns out my coworkers had just locked the sliding glass window after about 20 seconds of dealing with the people. From what I was told, they stayed outside for a minute or two, but eventually left when they saw a manager picking up a phone. This story does have a bright side though. I was wrong. The shake machine was not shut down yet and there were some nuggets and one cheese sauce left. So I wound up getting dinner after all. So that's all for tonight. People showing up late is a pretty common thing and we don't usually have to threaten people with the police. So someone taking this normal situation in such an extreme way was pretty memorable. Have any of you ever had Chick-fil-A? And if so, did you like it? Please let me know. They're okay. I prefer Panera Bread. My entitled father wants me to give up one of my $300 bikes. Some backstory. About four years ago now, I was 14 then, now 18. My brother and I got a bike each from our parents for our birthdays. Our birthdays are 12 days apart. These bikes were $60 from Walmart and so weren't made with the best parts. I decided that I would make my bike something of a project for me to learn about fixing up bikes. I poured a lot of my own money into this bike, changing the chain, the wheels, the seat, the handlebars. I had to replace the tubes no less than two times for each wheel and I learned to do it all with a little bit of help from our local bike shop when I got stuck on something. A little over two years ago, my brother, who never rode his own bike, decided that I could just have his as a backup if I needed. So just like with my own, I poured so much time and money into getting that bike to be just as good into my main one. All in all, I probably spent $300 on my main bike and maybe 200 to 250 on my backup. I am extremely proud of what I was able to accomplish with them. My father has always wanted the very best of everything, even if we couldn't afford it. He couldn't just have a TV. He needed a $600 TV with Wi-Fi connection. He didn't just need a computer monitor. He needed a $250 curved monitor. This all despite the fact we are often hanging at the edge of eviction from our house. Now, before you call me a hypocrite for spending my money on the bikes, I will point out that I have my own job and used solely money I had to spare on those bikes. My father hasn't had a job since 2011. My father refuses to go to the doctors to treat his diabetes and blood pressure issues because he believes that all the doctors want to do is make him think he is more sick than he is while draining all of his money. We actually had to fight him for two years to go to the doctors just so he could get disability so he could afford groceries and pay the bills instead of just one or the other. Anyways, recently my father has gotten the idea into his head that all he needs to feel better is to start exercising again. While this isn't the worst idea in the world, he is far beyond the point where only exercise can fix his problems. The guy can't even walk in a straight line or stand for more than 20 minutes without getting lightheaded. He has been told on one of the times we had to rush him to the ER that he has gotten so bad he needs medicine to fix the damage he has done to his body. He is also dealing with kidney failure and needs weekly dialysis, which he doesn't consider in the same league as those evil doctor visits. He's in no shape to be riding a bike, but that didn't stop him from coming to me while I was looking over the back tire of my bike. I crashed like an idiot and the tire warped. The following conversation happened. My father. Hey OP, how close are you to fixing that bike? Me. I don't really know. I think the back tire may be warped. If so, I might need a new one. Well, you have two bikes, and so I was thinking that when you get that one fixed, maybe I could have it to ride around this summer. It would really help me feel better. Now, I have actually lent my bikes out to friends before as we live in a small town, and honestly, you don't need a car to get from place to place so most of us just go around on bikes in the summer to save gas. But this man was so sick, he was leaning on the door frame just to talk to me. I was not about to have him riding one of my bikes and crashing it and getting himself and my bike hurt. I also knew when he crashed it 
I would have to fix it right away. So no thank you. Me. Um, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. Maybe we could just get you a new $60 one from Walmart. Dad. But I don't want one from there. Those bikes are crap and will break so fast. Me. Well, I don't feel comfortable with you on one of my bikes. You are sick and I think you would crash it and I know you won't be able to fix it. Dad. They're not even your bikes anyway. We bought them for you and your brother and he didn't want his. Surely you don't need both. Me. Actually, I do. This one needs work and I still need a way of getting around. Plus, you said those bikes belong to me and my brother and he didn't want his. So they are mine, unless you want to give me the money I put into them back. Dad. We bought them. They are ours. Me. No, I spent my money on them. And the only thing that is still original on that bike is the frame. I will pay you the $60 if you want and you can use it to buy your own bike. At this point, my father is red in the face and starts yelling about how I am so ungrateful and how he never gets to exercise and how it's no big deal. I refuse to budge. Eventually, our mom comes home and hears all of this. I kid you not, he goes to my mother like a toddler who has had his toy car stolen and says that I'm refusing to let him use my bike and that it's such BS. My mom, as if she could read my mind, says, why don't we just get you a cheap $60 bike to ride? You only need it to ride around the neighborhood. This made him go ballistic, throwing a fit about how we all had decent bikes except him, which isn't wrong as my mother bought a souped up bike she bought from the bike store when it was on sale for a charity event a few years ago. We pointed out that we both like to go trail riding and ride around town while he only wants to ride around the neighborhood. He said that it shouldn't matter that he had a right to have a decent bike. Eventually, my mother relented and offered to let him use her old bike. Although it's a really old bike and you'll never guess who is in charge of fixing it up so he can ride it. If nothing else, I was told that once I fixed it up, I wouldn't have to do anything more. I am only going to change the tubes as the tires are still good enough and I am going to get the chain greased instead of replaced. What would you do if you were in this situation? Would you let your dad ride one of your bikes? Please let me know. Who needs a bike anyway? Why not just get a Mercedes or a BMW? He ruined my sister's only birth experience, so I made sure he'd never forget her. Our cast. We've got my sister. We'll call her Sarah for the story. We've got sister's ex-boyfriend, Paul. We've got ex-boyfriend's new wife, Jane. We've got ex-boyfriend's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Doe. We've got oldest brother, Zeke, our parents, and me. When I was 14 and my oldest sister, Sarah, was 22, we found out that she was pregnant with Paul, her boyfriend of four years. They immediately got engaged and they were really happy, for a time. Sarah had a horrible pregnancy, about 16 to 18 weeks in, the wonder of creating human life evaporated within her. She developed hypermesis, which if you don't know is a really bad morning sickness. She was constantly in pain. She developed gestational diabetes and just all around hated the experience. Around this time, Paul, the then fiance, started getting sick of the complaining. I believe the argument was, your body is built to do this, it can't be that bad. Sarah was due around Valentine's Day and Paul's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Doe, were very excited, both about the grandkid and the fact that he would be born on a holiday. She was very against that and really, really hoped that her son wouldn't be born on a holiday, even one as small as Valentine's Day. Her birthday sometimes falls on Easter and she hates it because it might make him feel that his day isn't very much about him. Well, Mrs. Doe says something like, well, if you name him Valentine or Valentino, then that'll make the day even more special to him. Again, sister hated the idea. She thought it was tacky, he'd be bullied for it, and just really didn't like the name Valentino. Paul loved it, but agreed to go with a more average name like Daniel or Jared. Fast forward to February, and she was ready to get this over with. Sarah had officially been put on bed rest because while standing or walking, her blood pressure took unexpected spikes and dips. I look back now, and goodness do I feel bad for her. She was doing her best to avoid giving birth on Valentine's Day because, again, she didn't want him to be born on a holiday. Unfortunately, births happen when they happen, and that baby was going to come on Valentine's Day whether she wanted him to or not. I remember waiting out in the waiting room with my dad, brothers, and Paul, 
who couldn't stand to be in the delivery room because it was gross. I was so mad that he could have gone in but wouldn't because he thought my sister was gross while giving birth, whereas I had to stay outside because I was too young to go in with my mom and other sister. Dad went home with the youngest twin brothers while the oldest, Zeke, stayed to watch me because I refused to leave. 16 hours after Sarah went into labor, my little nephew was officially part of the family on the evening of Valentine's Day. Unfortunately, Sarah was not okay. She had to go to an emergency C-section and while doing the operation discovered that the back of her uterus facing her spinal cord had a very large and very severe, thankfully non-cancerous, tumor. When I say large, I mean it was twice the size of a standard uterus. The doctors were shocked and didn't understand why nobody had noticed it on an ultrasound. It accounted for her severe back pain and blood pressure issues. The doctors immediately went in for more surgery to remove the tumor, but sadly ended up having to perform a full hysterectomy. This meant that my nephew would be Sarah's only child. Now, while Sarah was in for surgery, Paul was taking care of everything baby-related to make sure his son was okay. In my 14-year-old self's memory, I remember him being suitably distraught, but I didn't really pay him much mind and spent my time in the waiting room with my mother and other sister. Zeke, however, wanted to be a good future brother-in-law and make sure that Paul was okay. He found Paul filling out the baby paperwork on his own, looking, in my brother's words, like he had not a single worry in his mind. Zeke asked why Paul didn't wait for Sarah to fill out the paperwork as she should have been out of surgery within the hour, and Paul said that he just wanted her to get her rest and heal. That checked out with Zeke as he was 16 and didn't know any better at the time. Now I know what you're probably thinking, no he wouldn't, he knows how much she hates that name, and still she'd need to sign the paperwork too. My fellow people of Reddit, I regret to inform you that Paul forged Sarah's signature on the paperwork and waited until she was out of surgery to hand said paperwork over. My sweet nephew that was born on Valentine's Day was named Valentino on his first official birth certificate. I still to this day don't know why Paul and his family were so insistent about the name. He had even picked out a different one with my sister. And before you ask, no, he was never brought up on forgery charges because his parents were witnesses to her signing the papers even though they only got there at the last minute. So Sarah dumped him and got her son's name changed a month later. She was willing to do split custody with him because that's her son's father and she wants the kids to know him. But Paul vanished and she never heard anything back, which seemed weirdly out of character to us, until a mutual friend on Facebook was tagged in his wedding pictures six months later. Paul had apparently started cheating on her not long after she got pregnant. Sarah was livid, but there wasn't much she could do, so she filed for child support and continued to live her best life. Until six years later. This is where the revenge starts, my friends. So Sarah has been a single mother for the past six years and has been amazing at it. At this point in my career, I've been a hairdresser for about eight months at our local Great Clips. I'm working one day and who is seated before me but Jane, Paul's wife, herself. I take her back for a trim and she clearly has no idea who I am. That adds up because a mutual friend that still keeps in contact with Paul said that Jane doesn't know a thing. She has no idea about Sarah, that she was the other woman, or that Paul actually has a kid that he's been, infrequently, paying child support for. She's in the dark on it all. I told myself not to be a jerk and treat her like a normal customer, which I did. Now at this point, Jane was heavily pregnant, so a lot of our conversation was about that. She loved being pregnant, but it was hard. Her husband was so unsympathetic, big shocker, and she was due in 10 weeks, and they still hadn't picked out a name for their baby. Ladies and gentle peoples, this was my chance. I asked what kind of name she was looking for, and she said, I want something unique and unusual, but not ridiculous, like Brent Leahy. You know the ones I'm talking about. And Paul had suggested so many already and she didn't like any of them. So I, conniving little weasel I am, said, what about Sarah? My sister's name isn't actually Sarah. She was named after an older family member that passed not long after she was born. But there was no female equivalent for his name, so our parents created one. It's a beautiful name and just what Jane was looking for. She loved it. She stuck by it 
and I found out by stalking her Facebook months later that she had put her foot down about it and that that was their daughter's name. Now Paul has a daughter with his ex's name to remind him every day about her and to also remind him to pay his child support. Little nephew is 10 years old now with a new name and no contact with his biological father, though we do still sometimes call him Val as a family nickname. He likes it but doesn't want to bring it to school, so it's staying a family nickname. Sarah pretends to hate when we call him that in a joking way. As long as he likes it, she doesn't have a problem with it, and she's seeing a new guy who's really great and like a father to Val. Do you have any unique and interesting names picked out for the kids you'll have in the future? If so, what are they? Please let me know. If you're expecting a girl, I highly suggest Karen. Karen joins our club. Some years ago, I was finally out of debt and ready to start investing for my future, but I didn't have a clue how. That's when I heard about a national organization that promoted investment clubs, offering support and tools to help people like me learn about investing by doing it. I liked the idea, get smarter, play low stakes, and maybe have a beer or two while you do it. So I told a few friends, they talked to their friends, and pretty soon we had a budding investment club. Since we were all friends of friends, organizing went smoothly. We elected officers and adopted a simple charter based on the national group's templates. Minimum monthly dues were set at $10, an amount any one of us could afford to throw away. But any member could contribute more than the minimum if they liked, and to build up our investing pot, most of us did. Individual contributions bought shares in the club's holdings, like stock in a corporation. Higher contributions meant more shares, meant more voting power when we made club decisions. As we got rolling, a few more people heard about the club and expressed interest, so we created a little process. Attend three meetings as the guest of a member, then if you're still interested, club members decide whether to offer an invitation. We always did. Sign the charter, pay this month's dues, and you're in. Most new members paid extra for at least a little while to catch up to the voting power of the founding members, so everyone stood on more or less equal footing. By year two, we had settled into a friendly routine, holding monthly meetings that were one part socializing, one part learning, and one part considering what to do with our growing little pot of cash. We picked a few stocks, started buying a few shares at a time, and portfolio performance was added to the monthly treasurer's report. We cheered each modest gain and learned from our small losses. Then came Pat. Pat was an outlier in our friend group. Most of us knew her, but few knew her well. She had a reputation for being a little too loud, a little too blunt, a little too much of a jerk, a little too rude, but she was also known to be smart. In a club focused on learning, more smart couldn't hurt, right? Besides, our well-respected president had brought her in. And right away, Pat proved she was smart. She had reviewed our charter and our past minutes before she came to her first meeting. She asked solid questions about past decisions and our reasoning. She listened respectfully to the education and stock study presentations, probing politely, and made mostly appreciative comments after each meeting. Just a bit of a smarty thrown in once in a while, but we could handle a bit. After her third meeting, we sent her to the next room while we discussed inviting her to join us. There were a few misgivings expressed. We had all heard stories about Pat's capacity for unpleasantness, after all. But President said, I warned her pretty bluntly that she needs to behave when she's here. We're all friends, but this is business. Money is serious. So I told her, keep yourself in check. Leave your attitude outside. Ultimately, everyone agreed. She had indeed behaved. We had no reason to doubt her sincere interest. So we called Pat back in and President said, Congratulations, Pat. Just pay your dues and sign here. With a flourish, Pat handed Treasurer a $10 bill and everyone applauded as she signed the charter. Then she said, Thank you all, thank you. But frankly, you really don't have any way to keep me out. The room got quiet. She then turned to Treasurer and said, Now, next month, if I'm interpreting your little reports correctly, all I have to do is give you this much money and I'll have equal voting rights, is that right? That's about right, yes, came the answer. And if I were to give you that plus, and here she pointed at the bottom line of the club's total holdings, this amount, I'd become the new majority shareholder, right? I suppose. And then I'd be in charge of all the club decisions, declared Pat. That's right, 
Unless you all can keep ponying up more cash than I can, there's nothing you can do to stop me from running this club like my own private account with nearly double my money to play with, is there? And now that I've signed your silly charter, you don't even have any way to kick me out. So, see you all next month. She smirked, turned and left. The door had just barely closed when the room exploded. She was joking, right? Oh, heck no. The nerve. Could she really do that? That can't be real. How big a mistake did we just make? Wow, what a class A jerk. But as we looked over our template-based charter, we found she was right. There were requirements for tax reporting, officer fiscal responsibilities, bank and brokerage relationships, conflicts of interest, and a host of other issues we had never faced and never expected to face. There was boilerplate language about how to buy out a voluntary withdrawing member. There was a provision allowing us to involuntarily withdraw someone who didn't keep up with dues and or attendance, but we had no cap on individual member contributions and no provision allowing us to kick out a stakeholder so long as they continued to pay their dues and attend meetings. And we now realized that if she could make good on her threat to buy majority holding, Pat could simply outvote any attempt to amend our charter. A more elegant solution probably existed, but within 20 minutes, someone came up with the nuclear option. Two minutes later, we agreed to launch it. We accepted assignments, then went our separate ways to prepare for next month's meeting. That evening, everyone arrived a bit more promptly and settled a lot more quietly than usual. Pat looked smug as she took a seat, seeming not to care that no one spoke to her. She was ostentiously fanning herself with a personal check. Too bad we never saw it, so we'll never know if she really was ready to put her money where her loud mouth had been. President took the floor. Before I call the meeting to order, I have a personal announcement to make. I made a really poor recommendation to all of you last month. I feel the bad judgment I showed means I am not fit to be your president. I'm presenting my letter of resignation and my voluntary withdrawal from the club and solemnly gave the letter to secretary. Pat looked like she had been slapped, but she said nothing more. Treasurer spoke up. Just so you all know, President spoke to me earlier about this decision, so I've already calculated withdrawal payout and have it ready, according to the terms of our charter, and President took the check. Vice President spoke next. President, you weren't alone in that decision. I voted with you, and I also regret my poor judgment. Here is my letter of resignation and withdrawal. Treasurer said, and here is your withdrawal payout, prepared as we discussed. And it went on, in small clusters at first, then all in a rush. Each club member declared they had made a terrible decision, presented a letter, and collected an already prepared check. Sometime during the rush, Pat stopped being silent. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Seriously, you've made your point. That's enough now. You don't have to keep up this act. Knock it off already, you idiots. But we didn't. With all the letters collected, Secretary added them to the bank of a fat binder containing copies of all the club minutes and gave the binder to Pat. Your next club secretary will need this. Treasurer was right behind with a similar binder of financial records, a $10 bill on top. Here are all your club's accounting records and remaining assets. President added the signed charter to the stack. So Pat, looks like you're now a club of one. You win, good luck and goodbye. We all stood and stared silently until she shoved the stack to the floor and saw herself sputtering to the door. Within 10 minutes, we had signed our newly upgraded charter, re-elected our officers, torn up all of our payout checks, and put our new club back to business as usual. Okay, maybe just a bit more giggly and a bit more pleased with ourselves than usual. Never saw Pat again, didn't care. Lesson learned, never let Karen join your club. What if I don't want to join your stupid club? New coworker doesn't want help. Okay. Note, this story is old. I've not worked at this place for years. Also, this is not the same job as my post about helping my coworkers. Story time. I worked in a pharmacy dedicated to sending medications to nursing homes. Since this is often difficult to do just by hand, there were machines that could help out. I often helped use the machines to package the meds. A new coworker joined my team. She was pleasant enough, but for some reason I could not tell you, even to this day, why I hated her on sight. Apparently the feeling was mutual, though we were able to work together cordially enough. Since the machines, while super useful, were also prone to breaking down, a lot of manual intervention was required to ensure smooth operation. Since it's a pharmacy, 
We also had to keep track of the medications being used on it, which means counts, often done nightly, particularly with more expensive medications. This information is relevant. I had been at this job for a few years, so was reasonably experienced with the use and maintenance of the machines. Coworker wasn't. This is also where I point out that coworker is older than me. So, coworker had been at the job for a few weeks and had received some training. So, my boss at the time, I've written a post about that creature elsewhere, told me that it'd be okay for her to shadow me while I worked, but also to make sure she did some of the work on her own so she had learned via hands on experience. This also meant I couldn't leave until coworker did, since she hadn't been given the go ahead to be alone with the machine. Goody. It went more or less okay for the majority of the shift. I let coworker do some of the work as ordered by my supervisor and she seemed to be getting it. However, for some reason, she wasn't relying on the computer, which had kept track of all the medications used and their corresponding slots to do the nightly count. Instead, she was literally writing down every single slot and medication by hand to count later. Coworker, I said, you know the computer keeps track of that. I know it does, yarn and metal but I don't seem to get how to do it. This is towards the end of my shift. My nerves were fried from having to deal with her and I was tired. You do it like this, coworker. I show her. I don't get it, yarn and metal, so I'm just going to do it by hand. You younger people don't seem to have a problem with computers, but I do. Let me do it by myself. People, the process to see what had been used was literally two clicks of a mouse button. I had shown her once at the start of our shift our supervisor had shown her during initial training. Another coworker had shown her while she was training. I was done. So I let her do exactly what she wanted. Let her write down every canister by hand, every med by hand, and let her count by hand. I even offered, as a show of good faith, to help with the counting. But again, no yarn and metal, I'll do it. Let me do it by myself. Fine. As a result, we ended up leaving an hour after our shifts were supposed to end. That's an hour of overtime that we hadn't been authorized to take for the record. Next day, my supervisor asks me why I'd stayed so late. So I told her very honestly that coworker didn't want my help finishing out the necessary counts last night. Supervisor, being what she was, yes, my wording there is deliberate, immediately went and ripped coworker a new one. The day after, coworker didn't come in. We all found out she had quit. Effective immediately. Good riddance, I guess. Bonus aftermath. I also found out the day after I had to stay so late that the Count's coworker did, they were wrong. All of them. What would you guys rather do? Count things by hand or use a computer? Please let me know in the comments below. I prefer to do it myself, but there's one thing that I have to use technology for. And what's that? Obliterating that like button for Mr. Reddit. Oh, nice. Karen, hit us with those announcements. As you wish. Huge shout out to our newest official channel members, Demonte and Jay. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Become a channel member today or join us on Patreon and we'll give you a special shout out in our next video. And now you can have me record a silly message for you or a loved one. Learn all about it on our Fiverr. Link in the description. And shout outs to our regenerals of the day. Anne Swan, Sebastian, and Josh.